The Lacanian Subject by Bruce Fink. This is chapter 7. Object A, Cause of Desire. With Object A, Lacan felt he had made his most significant contribution to psychoanalysis. Few concepts in the Lacanian opus are elaborated so extensively, revised so significantly from the 1950s to the 1970s, worked over from so many different perspectives, and requires so many modifications in our usual ways of thinking about desire, transference, and science. And few concepts have so many avatars in Lacan's work. The other, Agelma, the golden number, the Freudian thing, the real, the anomaly, the cause of desire, surplus jouissance, the materiality of language, the analyst's desire, logical consistency, the other's desire, semblance, sham, the lost object, and so on and so forth. As literally thousands of pages in Lacan's work, most of it is as yet unpublished, are devoted to the development of this concept. I cannot possibly hope to provide an account for object A that adequately explains or covers all of Lacan's glosses. Moreover, many of his elaborations involve algebraic, topological, and logical formulations that would require extensive commentary and be of little interest to most readers. While warranting a book-length study, I shall limit myself here to what I consider to be some of the most salient aspects of Lacan's foremost contribution to psychoanalysis. In earlier chapters of this book, I was obliged to introduce, to introduce object A in a number of different contexts to explain the advent of the subjects and corresponding changes in the other. As is only to be expected, Lacan's concept of the object and the subject undergo contemporaneous revisions, and one cannot grasp Lacan's theory at any particular moment in time without taking both concepts into account. In chapter 3, I referred to object A as the residue of symbolization. The real, R2, that remains, insists and exists after or despite symbolization as the traumatic cause, and as that which interrupts the smooth functioning of law and the automatic unfolding of the signifying chain. In chapter 5, I discussed object A as the last reminder or remainder of the hypothetical mother-child unity, to which the subject clings in fantasy to eat, to achieve a sense of wholeness, as the other's desire, as the jouissance object, as that part of the mother the child takes with it in separation, and as the foreign, fateful cause of the subject's existence that he or she must become or subjectify in analysis. In chapter 6, I briefly mentioned object A in the context of Freud's lost object, as the subject's being, and as a product of the dialectization of a master signifier. The reader's task in thinking together all of these ways of talking about object A has not been an easy one, and I hope to partially rectify that in the present chapter. Nevertheless, just as in part two of this book, it was not always possible to think together all of his formulations concerning the subject. It is not a simple matter to reconcile all of his formulations concerning the object. This is, no doubt, part of what makes the concept so fruitful for further thought, but so infuriating to the systematizer and so bothersome to the scientifically minded. Can a concept which is so highly polyvalent be of any value to the constitution of psychoanalysis as a significant discourse, much less as a science? I will take up the relation between psychoanalysis and science in chapter 10. Here, let us back up several steps and consider the concept of the object from the perspective of the imaginary, the symbolic, and the real. This will provide some perspective on the evolution of Lacan's notion of the object from the 1930s on. Object Relations Imaginary Objects, Imaginary Relations The foremost imaginary object is the ego. As I explained in the first subsection of chapter 4, the ego is an imaginary production, a crystallization or sedimentation of images of an individual's own body and of self-images reflected back to him or her by others. In contradistinction to Freud, Lacan maintains that this crystallization does not constitute an agency, but rather an object. 
that object is connected or invested with libido like other objects. And thus the infant's own ego is not necessarily connected any more than other objects or egos in the infant's environment. The object as understood at this imaginary level is one towards which libido is directed or withdrawn, as is the case with love objects as we find them in Freud's work. Playing off the inherently foreign and object-like nature of the ego, Lacan refers to it in the early 1950s as an other, autre in French, hence his abbreviation A for the ego, which is usually italicized, indicating, in accordance with Lacan's general typographical conventions, that it is imaginary. One's own ego is, des is designated as A and another's ego as A with like a, what's that word? Is it apostrophe? I don't know. Such designations highlight the similarity between them. Imaginary relations are not illusory relationships, relationships that don't really exist, but rather relations between egos, wherein everything is played out in terms of but one opposition, same or different. They involve other people who you consider to be like yourself for a variety of reasons. It could be because the two of you look very much alike, are similar in size or age, and so on. In the case of an infant, it is generally that child in the family, extended family, or circle of friends who bears the greatest affinity to the infant in terms of size, age, interests, and abilities, and who also stands in a similar relation to a parental or authority figure. The determination of who is similar and who is not thus also involves symbolic components. There's a couple of figures here on page 85 that you might want to check out. I'm not explaining them. Same, love in bracket, brackets, different, hate in, back, in brackets. Corresponding to the main imaginary opposition of same and different, imaginary relationships are characterized by two salient features, love, identification, and hate, rivalry. Insofar as the other is like me, I love and identify with him or her, feeling his or her joy and pain as my own. In the case of identical twins, one often finds that one twin cathects the other twin's ego almost as much as his or her own. This is true, though no doubt to a lesser extent, in many close-knit families, there being a great deal of solidarity among the children. In such cases, we see the ever-so-rare implementation of the biblical injunction to love thy neighbor as thyself. Insofar as I love myself, another self like myself is equally worthy of love. This also explains, in a sense, the flip side of such close identification, the tension generated by la petite différence. Difference inevitably creeps between even the most identical of twins, whether due to differential treatment by parents or changes in appearance over time, and the closer the relationship at the outset, the greater the rage over minute differences is likely to be. Sibling rivalry is the best known example of imaginary relations involving hatred, whereas very young children usually do not call into question their subordination to their parents. Perceiving a clear difference between the parents and themselves, they do regularly contest, right from a very tender age, their rank and status among their siblings. Children generally consider their siblings as in the same category as themselves and cannot abide overly preferential treatment by the parents of anyone other than themselves, double standards, and so on. They come to hate their siblings for taking away their special place in the family, stealing the limelight, and performing better than they do in activities valued by the parents. That same kind of rivalry generally extends in time to classmates, cousins, neighborhood friends, and so on. The rivalry in such relationships very often revolves around status symbols and implies all kinds of other symbolic and linguistic elements as well. What distinguishes such relationships is that the two parties see themselves as more or less equals, regardless of slight age differences, grade point averages, social success, and so on, and can very easily imagine themselves as in the other's shoes, rivalry and jealousy arising out of such comparisons. 
those whom we consider like ourselves generally stand in a similar relation to the other as we do. And since the other generalizes from our parents to the academic other, the law, religion, God, tradition, as so on and so on, imaginary relations are not simply relations characteristic of early childhood that are somehow outgrown in time. They remain important to all our lives. In, er in the early to mid-1950s, the other A is the, is the Lacanian object, and there is no other object in view in Lacan's work. It is not until Seminar 12, where Lacan explores Das Ding, Seminar 13, where he isolates, isolates Agelma in Plato's Symposium, and Seminar 19, that Lacan begins to conceptualize a wholly different kind of object, a real object, cause of desire. From then on, Lacan devotes virtually all of his interest to the latter, but in no sense invalidates the importance of the objects situated at the imaginary level. Consider, for example, the analytic situation. In analysis, the analyst is often taken by the analysand, especially at the outset, as a stand-in for the imaginary other. This is seen in the analysand's attempt to identify with the analyst as like the, an the analysand the same as the analysand in terms of level of culture, interests, psychoanalytic orientation, religion, or what have you. In my own practice, it is quite common for analysands to mention within two or three sessions that we have the same books on our shelves, implying thereby that our concerns and perspectives are the same. This attempt to find similarities to identify with me as an other may at first give rise to love, but ultimately leads to rivalry, the analysand may at first cast may at first cast me as similar to him or herself, but is then led to seek out areas in which he or she is different, that is, superior or inferior. This level of rivalry is the level at which Lacan situates what most American analysts call counter transference. It is the level at which the analyst gets caught up in the same game of comparing him or herself with his or her analysands, sizing their discourse up in terms of his or her own. Are they ahead of me or behind me in their comprehension of what is going on he here in the analytic setting or elsewhere? Are they submissive to my wishes? Do I have any control over the situation? Do I have the upper hand? How come this person gets on my nerves and makes me feel so lousy about myself? Lacan's perspective is not that counter-transferential feelings do not exist, but that they are always and inescapably situated at the imaginary level, and thus must be set aside by the analyst. They must not be revealed to the analysand, as that positions the analyst and analysand at the same level, as imaginary others for each other, capable of having similar feelings, hang-ups, insecurities, and so on. Such positioning prevents the analysand from casting the analyst in some other role. The other is object, symbolic relations. All of these are aimed at some other person, but most of all at the prehistoric, unforgettable other person who was never equaled by anyone later. That was a quote from Freud. Symbolic relations are those with the other as language, knowledge, law, career, academia, authority, morality, ideals, and so on, and with the objects designated, or more strongly stated, demanded by the other, grades, diplomas, success, marriage, children, all the things usually associated with anxiety and neurosis. Nevertheless, the only true important object, if it may loosely be called one, at the level of symbolic relations in the analytic situation is the analyst as other, as avatar or representative of the other. In Lacan's two-tiered model of the analytic setting, imaginary and symbolic, characteristic of his work in the early to mid-1950s, the goal in analyzing neurotics is to eliminate the interference in symbolic relations created by imaginary relations. In other words, to get imaginary interests out of the way so as to confront the analysand with his or her problems with the other as such. In the case of heterosexual neurotics, for example, this generally involves, among other things, 
working through and thus dissipating imaginary identifications with members of the same sex. And then there's a figure here, figure 7.2. You can check it out, page 87. At this early stage of Lacan's work, the subject consists in a stance adopted with respect to this other, a symptomatic stance in which the subject tries to maintain the right distance from the other, never fully meeting the other's demands, but never frustrating them altogether either, never getting too close to achieving those goals promulgated by the other, but never too far away from achieving them either. Analysts are often cast in the position of the other by their analyseans. Lacan formulates this by saying that the analyst is viewed by the analyseian as the subject supposed to know, to know what is the matter when psychological difficulties arise, when symptoms appear, and so on. In Western societies, analysts are often presumed to have such knowledge, even by people who never consult an analyst in their lifetimes. This presumption has to do with the social function of psycho psychoanalysis in certain parts of the world today. A problem arises, however, if the analyst agrees to play the role of the subject supposed to know and falls into the trap of believing he or she really does know that which can never be known in advance, but only constructed in the course of analysis. Um, the analyst thereby slips into a false sense of mastery, which generates an imaginary relationship with the analysand. Analysis has taken over the former role of confession for many and prayer atonement for others, situating the analyst in the godlike position of the all-knowing other, fit to deliberate on all questions of normal and abnormal, right and wrong, good and bad, Lacan at one point identifies the analysian's assumption that the analyst has a certain stock of knowledge about his or her symptom, desire, fantasy, and pleasure as the mainspring of transference. The projection of knowledge onto another elicits love, transference love. But while all of these factors predestine the analyst for the role of other, he or she must not fall into the trap of interpreting from that position. Freud, of course, did just that at the outset. For years, he explained to his analysis his theories about the unconscious, repression, symptom formation, and so on, interpreting what they told him on the basis thereof, and, it, and attempting to elicit from them an expression of agreement or belief. Fortunately, he did not worry too much if that expression was not forthcoming, and gradually abandoned the approach of explaining everything he thought, his whole way of understanding the situation, to his analysis. For espousing a theory in the analytic situation is very likely to lead analysis to seek ways of disproving it, as did the butcher's wife discussed by Freud in the interpretation of dreams, who claimed to have had a dream which disproved Freud's theory that every dream is the fulfillment of a wish, of coming up with a better theory than the, anal the analysts, thereby removing the analyst from the position of the subject supposed to know, casting him or her instead as an ordinary person like the analysand, who is not always right and who may even turn out to be dumber than the analysand. It is not that the analyst must, at all costs, remain in the position of the subject supposed to know, quite the contrary, but explicitly acting as if one were such a subject tends to elicit imaginary relations of rivalry on the analysand's part, the worst possible relations between analyst and analysand. That is pitfall one. Pitfall two, if analysts believe they really do have that presumed knowledge, they are bound to hand down interpretations as if they were lecturing from a pulpit, providing interpretations which can have little, if any, beneficial effect on their analysands, and serve only to make the latter more dependent on their, anal on their analysts. For by responding to the analysand's demand for advice and interpretation, for understanding of his or her symptoms, the analyst gives what he or she has, knowledge, instead of what he or she does not have, lack, in other words, desire, and encourages the analysand to demand rather than, des demand rather than desire, to remain alienated rather than separate. 
the analyst, rather than considering him or herself to be the representative of knowledge in the analytic situation, must take the analysand's unconscious as the representative of knowledge. The unconscious, when it speaks or manifests itself through interruptions, slips, and slurs of the analysand's speech, bungled actions, forgotten appointments, mistaken dollar amounts, must be taken by the analyst to be the ultimate authority, the other, the subject supposed to know. Nevertheless, at the outset, the analysand casts the analyst as the other of demand. In other words, the usually parental other to whom the analysand has always addressed his or her demands for knowledge, help, nourishment, recognition, attention, affection, approval, and disapproval. All such demands boil down, according to Lacan, to one and the same thing, the demand for love. Above and beyond all the specific demands one formulates, it is always love that one is seeking. Certain analysts, including, for example, Winnicott, believe that it is the analyst's duty to play mother to the analysand, as the analysand's neurosis is indicative of inadequate mothering. According to them, the analyst has to attempt to be a good enough mother, making up for the inadequate attention approval, disapproval, love, and discipline the analysand received growing up. The analyst has to be the perfect love object, neither smothering nor absent. The problem, according to Lacan, is that this mistakes the analysand ever more dependent on the... That, sorry, is that this makes the analysand ever more dependent on the analyst, and the analysand's desire, as expressed in his or her fantasy, comes to revolve entirely around the analyst's demand that the analysand get better, dream, daydream, reflect, or whatever else it is the analyst demands, or the analysand thinks the analyst is demanding. Analysts always make some demands on their analysands regarding appointment times, frequency of sessions, payment, and speech, requiring the analysand to say whatever comes to mind, for instance. But when the analyst is cast as parental other, such demands are read as signs of love, which in turn fuel the analysand's demands, fixating him or her on one love object. For love, correlated with demand, has an object. When Freud speaks of object choice, it has to do with the subject's rep repetitive demand for the same kind of love object, or the same kind of relationship with a love object. And when Lacan, in his early work, speaks of objects of desire or in desire, such objects are clearly love objects, in other words, objects to which the subject addresses his or her demand for love. In the early to mid-1950s, Lacan conceives of analysis as involving a progressive dissipation of the analysis imaginary relations, and a progressive bringing into focus of his or her symbolic relations that is, his or her relationship to the other. At this point in his theory, analysis consists ultimately in a rectification of the subject's position with respect to the other, an other not embodied by the analyst. Lacan believes at this time that such repositioning brings about a kind of full-fledged desire, free from the other's dominion. Later, however, Lacan comes to see that an analysis carried out at this level does not go far enough in constituting the subject as desire and, lives, and leaves him or her stuck at the level of demand, dependent upon the other's demand. In Seminar 1, Lacan already situates the other as language, tradition, etc. between the analyst and analysand, but the analyst's eccentric role is nowhere specified there. All Lacan stresses at that point is the analysand's relation to the other, and, as we have seen, if the analyst does not truly relinquish or renounce the role of other by assuming some other position, the analysand remains stuck or stranded at the level of demand, hung up on the other's demand, unable to truly desire. In examining the various roles of the analyst as the analysand's object, other or other, so like small other, or other with a capital O, we have seen that the analyst must avoid the pitfalls of the imaginary, thinking of him or herself as like the analysand, however true this may be in many, in many respects, and must not interpret from, from the position of the omniscient other. 
Where then is the analyst to situate him or herself? If the analyst is to be neither imaginary rival nor representative of the other, what kind of object is there left to be? What role then is left to the analyst? What part does the analyst play in the analysis psychic economy? It is Lacan's elaboration of the nature of desire that allows him to answer those questions. Let us jump right to his conclusions regarding desire. Real objects encounters with the real. Desire is neither the appetite for satisfaction nor the demand for love, but the difference which results from the subtraction of the first from the second, the very phenomenon of their splitting. That was a quote from Lacan. Um, je te demande de refuser ce que je t'offre parce que ce n'est pas ça. Another quote from Lacan. Just because people ask you for something doesn't mean that's what they really want you to give them. Um, another quote from Lacan. Oh, that might actually... I don't know. Okay. Desire, strictly speaking, has no object. In its essence, desire is a constant search for something else. And there is no specifiable object that is capable of satisfying it. In other words, extinguishing it. Desire is fundamentally caught up in dialectical movement of one signifier to the next. And is diametrically opposed to fixation. It does not seek satisfaction, but rather its own continuation and furtherance. More desire, greater desire... It wishes merely to go on desiring. Thus, desire, according to Lacan, is not all that goes by that name in common parlance, for it is rigorously distinct from demand. The only object involved in desire is that object, if we can still refer to it as an object that causes desire. Desire has no object as such. It has a cause, a cause that brings it into being, that Lacan dubs object A, cause of desire. The bracketing or placing in parentheses of the object, yeah, because it was object and then A in brackets, <clears throat> seen most clearly in Lacan's 1966 post-face, simply called Sweet, to the seminar on the purloined letter, is a sign of the object's transposition from the imaginary register to the real. Lacan no longer writes object A, the A being in italics, but rather object A in brackets. It is no doubt misleading in many ways to even retain the term object in speaking of the cause, but by maintaining the term while changing its meaning, Lacan is, in a sense, is seeking to preempt discussion of what more commonly in psychoanalytic theory goes by the name object, implicitly suggesting that it is of only secondary importance. Object A in brackets as the cause of desire is that which elicits desire. It is responsible for the advent of desire for the particular form the desire in question takes, and for its intensity. Drawn schematically, we have cause, um, arrow to desire, and then arrow to metonomic slippage from one object to the next. Let us now back up for a moment. What arouses desire in a child is the other's desire, not the other's demand, nor even the other's desire for this or that particular thing or person. The other's desire as it alights upon specific objects and people directs the child's desire but does not cause it. It is the other's desire as pure desirousness, manifested in the other's gaze at something or someone, but distinct from that something or someone, that elicits desire in the child. It is not so much the object looked at as the looking itself, the desire manifested in the very act of looking, for example, that arouses the child's desire. Apart from the various qualities or attributes analysands mention to their analysts as playing a role in their object choice, hair color, eye color, and so on, analysands often recount something far more difficult to get a handle on or put into words. A certain way a man has of looking at a woman may sum up for that woman everything she really wants in a man. Not what she says she wants in a man, appealing to typical American discourse about needs, a need affection, support, and encouragement. For that is all conscious ego discourse, verily and truly the discourse of the other, the social American other. That particular way of looking, that, to use an example, impertinent, unblinking way of looking, may be what really causes her to desire. 
stimulating in her a desire which cannot be extinguished by all the fine qualities revindicated by the ego. A man who is caring, a good father, a good provider, and so on and so forth. It is the desire-causing look that determines for her what Freud called object choice and what I will call the choice of companions. For that look, as found in the world, is associated with someone, an individual. That individual is adopted as the subject's companion in the hope of remaining in close proximity to the, de the desire-inspiring look. But the fact of the matter is that the companion, with all his individual characteristics, foibles, distinguishing qualities, etc., has little or no value to desire compared with the cause. The woman may be interested in little else in her companion than his ability to give her that look. Should he no longer be able to, to due to a turnaround in their relationship, she, m she may well move on searching to situate herself anew in that desire eliciting relation to a certain kind of look. In the case of certain men, it is a woman's voice that is of primary importance. It is not so much what she says as the way in which she says it, the tone and timbre of her voice that arouses their desire. When a man has found someone's, someone whose voice expresses desire in much the same way as did his mother's voice, for example, he may fly in the face of public opinion, social pressure, and conventional morality, abandoning his search for a woman with all the qualities he was taught to seek out. Not necessarily for love, as is commonly thought, but for desire, in order to be able to maintain a position as desiring subject. Note that the two examples I have thus far given of object A in brackets are the other's desires manifested in the voice and in the gaze, both of which are uns unspecularizable. You cannot see them per se. They have no mirror images, and they are extremely difficult to symbolize or formalize. They belong to the register of what Lacan calls the real, and resist imaginarization and symbolization. They are nevertheless closely related to the subject's most crucial experiences of pleasure and pain, excitement and disappointment, thrill and horror. They resist analytic action, which involves speech, putting things into words, trying to say what the problem is, to speak it, and are related to a jouissance that defines the subject's very being. The real is essentially that which resists symbolization and thus resists the dialecti dialectization characteristic of the symbolic order in which one thing can be substituted for another. Not everything is fungible. Certain things are not interchangeable for the simple reason that they cannot be signifi signifierized. They cannot be found elsewhere. As they have a thing-like quality, requiring the subject to come back to them over and over again. The challenge Lacanian psycho psychoanalysis accepts is that in of inventing ways in which to hit the real, upset the repetition it engenders, dialectize the isolated thing, and shake up the fundamental fantasy in which the subject constitutes him or herself in relation to the cause. Lost Objects Lacan explicitly acknowledges his debt to a number of psychoanalysts who helped him on his way to the concept Object A in brackets. Carl Abraham, Melanie Klein, Part Objects, and Donald Winnicott, Transitional Objects. Nevertheless, it is clearly to Freud that he is most indebted for his formulation of the notion of the lost object. As is so often the case, however, Lacan's lost object goes far beyond anything found in Freud's work. Examined in context, Freud never claims that objects are inexorably or irremediably lost, or that the rediscovery or refining of an object implies an object that is always already lost. Consider, for example, what Freud says in Negation. Experience has taught that it is important not only for a thing, an object which affords satisfaction, to possess the property of being good, thus deserving to be taken into the ego, but also for it to be there in the outside world, ready to be seized when needed. In order to understand this step forward from the simple judgment of attribution of the quality good or bad to the judgment of existence, we must recall that all representations, mental images, come from perceptions and are repetitions thereof. 
At the outset, the very existence of a representation thus guarantees the reality, the existence in the outside world, of that which is represented, imagined, or pictured in the mind. The opposition between subjective and objective does not exist from the first. It is only constituted by the fact that thought has the ability to make present a second time something that was once perceived, by reproducing it in a representation, the outside object no longer having to be present. Thus, the first and most immediate aim of reality testing is not to find an object in real perception corresponding to what is rep uh, represented in the mind, but to refine such an object, to convince oneself that it is still out there. An essential precondition for the institution of reality testing is clearly that objects shall have been lost, which formerly afforded real satisfaction. That's the end of the long ass quote from Freud. Freud does not claim here that the object is of its very nature lost in any absolute sense. An object is encountered at the outset, not actively sought out by the child, because the child is not able to seek out an object until after such an encounter. Afterwards, the memory of the experience of satisfaction is recalled to mind, reactivated, so to speak, or reconnected, and satisfaction may be either hallucinated, primary process, or sought out in the external world, secondary process. Thus, there is no initial object finding but only a Wiltser finding. No deliberate finding of an object, only a refinding of an object in the outside world that corresponds to one's memory of an experience of satisfaction once happened upon. Animals, by contrast, are led to find what instinct, as a sort of imprinted, pre-inscribed, encrypted knowledge, instructs them to look for. Humans lacking such innate knowledge of what will provide satisfaction must first encounter it through the good graces of fortune, and only then can initiate action to repeat the satisfying experience. Similarly, when Freud says in the three essays on the theory of sexuality that the finding of an object is in fact a refinding of it, he is referring to the fact that object choice after the latency period repeats the child's first object choice, the breast. Here, too, an initially encountered object is found anew at some later point in time. Freud's language is, nevertheless, highly suggestive, and Lacan provides a sort of Talmudic reading, as he himself says in Seminar 7 of Freud's texts, attaching more importance to the letter of the text than to its fairly obvious meaning. If the object was never found, strictly speaking, that is perhaps because it is essentially phantasmatic in nature, not corresponding to a remembered experience of satisfaction. There, there never was such an object in the first place. The lost object never was. It is only constituted as lost after the fact, in that the subject is unable to find it anywhere other than in, in fantasy or dream life. Using Freud's text as a springboard, the object can be viewed as always already lost. We could account for the lost object in yet another way. The breast is not, during the first experience of satisfaction, constituted as an object at all, much less as an object that is not part of the infant's body and, and that is largely beyond the infant's control. It is only constituted after the fact, after numerous vain attempts by the infant to repeat that first experience of satisfaction, when the mother is not present or refuses to nurse the child. It is the absence of the breast and thus the failure to achieve satisfaction that leads to its constitution as an object as such, an object separate from and not controlled by the child. Once constituted, i.e. symbolized, though the child may as yet still be unable to speak in any way intelligible to others, the child can never again refine the breast as experienced the first time around, as not separate from his or her lips, tongue and mouth, or from his or herself. Once the object is constituted, the primal state wherein there is no distinction between infant and breast, or between subject and object, for the subject only comes into being when the lacking breast is constituted as object, and qua relation to that object, can never be re-experienced, and thus the satisfaction provided the first time can never be repeated. A kind of innocence is lost forever, and the actual breasts found thereafter are never quite it. 
Object A is the leftover of that process of constituting an object, the scrap that evades the grasp of symbolization. It is a reminder that there is something else, something perhaps lost, perhaps yet to be found. That is precisely what I said of object A in, bracket, in brackets in chapter 5. It is the remainder of the lost hypothetical mother-child unity. The Freudian thing. Other aspects of the Lacanian object are derived from Freud's work in a similar fashion. Das Ding, the thing, already encountered in the passage from negation quoted above, is extensively discussed by Lacan in Seminar 7 on the basis of Freud's Project for a Scientific Psychology. There, Freud describes the thing in neuronal terms as that which is invariable in, say, the infant's various perceptions of the breast. The one neuron, neuron A, as it is felicitously referred to in Freud's manuscript, in the neuronal complex corresponding to the constant portion of the perceptual complex. That which is variable, neuron B, comes into association with other neurons. The seed of memories of other specific perceptions, establishing links with them. In Lacan's translation on Freud's neurons as signifiers and of the so-called facilitations, uh, breaches, among them as the articulations or links between signifiers, we find something, neuron A, which remains isolated or cut off from the rest of the signifying chain. Though the chain necessarily circles around it, the thing, alias, object, A, in brackets, Freud extends his description to the other, the fellow human being, fellow creature, or neighbor, who first cares for the infant in its helpless state. The complex of a fellow creature falls into two portions. One of these gives the impression of being a constant structure and remains as a coherent thing. Insofar as that constant portion remains cut off from associative links with the other neurons, in other words, signifiers, Lacan can continue his translation as follows. Das Ding is from the outset, what I call the non-signified, or beyond of the signified. The subject keeps his distance from this non-signified and from an effective relation to it, constituting himself in a type of relation characterized by primal affect that is prior to any and all repression. Here, Das Ding appears as the unsignified and unsignifiable object within the other or other complex. In the other yet more than or sorry sorry in the other yet more than or beyond the other it is that object from which the subject keeps his or her distance not getting too close or too far away either the subject comes into being as a defense against it against the primal experience of pleasure pain associated with it the subject's relation to it is characterized by a primal affect whether this be revulsion, disgust, or aversion, as in hysteria, or a sense of being overwhelmed or overcome, leading to avoidance, as in obsession. Indeed, these differing primal effects, primal stances adopted with respect to the thing, object A, encountered by the infant in its relations with a fellow creature, parental other, constitute structural diagnostic criteria by which to distinguish hysteria from obsession. In Freud's letters to Fleece, in particular, we see that hysteria is defined as a particular kind of affective response to a sexually charged primordial, primordial encounter with an other person, one of unpleasure or disgust, whereas obsession is variously defined in terms of a different response, pleasure, a sense of being overwhelmed, and guilt. Here we see that what Lacan calls the Freudian thing is an early version of object A in brackets and that the primal relation to it described by Freud is the same as that constituted by the fundamental fantasy, as described above in chapters 5 and 6. Surplus value, surplus jouissance. In seminar 16, Lacan equates object A with Marx's concept of surplus value as that which is most highly prized or valued by the subject. Object A in brackets is related to the former gold standard, the value against which all other values, e.g. currencies, precious metals, gems, etc., were measured. For the subject, it is that value he or she is seeking in all of his or her activities and relations. 
surplus value corresponds in quantity to what in capitalism is called interest or profit. It is that which the capitalist skims off the top for him or herself, instead of paying it to the employees. It also goes by the name of reinvestment capital and by many other euphemisms as well. It is, loosely speaking, the fruit of the employee's labor. When in legal documents written in American English, someone is said to have the right to the fruit or usufruct of a particular piece of property or sum of money held in trust, it means that that person has a right to the profit generated by it, though not necessarily to the property or money itself. In other words, it is a right, not of ownership, but rather of enjoyment. In everyday French, you could say that that person has la jouissance of said property or money. In the more precise terms of French finance, that would mean that he or she enjoys not the land, buildings, or capital itself. Um, la nue propriété, literally naked property, but merely its excess fruits, its product above and beyond that required to re reimburse its upkeep, cultivation, and so on. In a word, its operating expenses. Note that in French legal jargon, jouissance is more closely related to possession. The employee never enjoys that surplus product. He or she loses it. The work process produces him or her as an alienated subject, simultaneously producing a loss. The capitalist, as other, enjoys that excess product, and thus the subject finds him or herself in the unenviable situation of working for the other's enjoyment, sacrificing him or herself for the other's jouissance, precisely what the neurotic most abhors. Like surplus value, this surplus jouissance may be viewed as circulating outside of the subject in the other. It is a part of the libido that circulates horse core, or or cor. I don't know. I don't know how to pronounce that. <clears throat> it says, see this section on castration in chapter 8 for further discussion of this point. The distinction between an object of desire and an object which causes desire is truly a crucial one. Unfortunately, explanations of object A in brackets in the literature are often, often cast in the same basic language as that used in discussing Freudian objects. The mother is the child's first object. A boy must go on to find another love object of the same sex as, as his mother. A young girl must go on to find a love object of the opposite sex from that of her, her first main object, and so on. This merely compounds the difficulty of grasping an already highly complex part of Lacan's theory. The discussion I have provided here is by no means exhaustive, and further facets of object A in brackets are taken up in the chapters to come as well as in the appendices.